just well, doing banging and that sort of thing, or just... Oh, like, are we going to do so, your eyes? Yeah, no. Just, no. Like, which, which, which way round are we speaking? Yeah. You guys can decide between yourselves. Um, yeah. Echo. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, okay. 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 Uh, are we doing so? What are we doing? Seven. So, what are we going to do? Uh, I don't think we're going to do it. Don't need to worry about okay. setting okay. time. Yeah. 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 Un unnecessary complication. We just tell you how wrong you are after you finish speaking. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, so I suppose so. so Bates, you're speaking first, on the so yes. side. Speaking about how. And James. Yeah, I do a lot for regular Okay. Yeah. 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 Some benefits broadly can be loaded. And then I talk about the numbers and the data and the how it works in terms of regulation. Three minutes, two sides of that. So, hello everyone, uh, I want to welcome you all to the big animal research debate here at Imperial. Um, just before we start, can I ask that everyone puts their phones on silent or off, ideally, just to keep this you know, nice and fluid and, and prevent any interruptions. Um, so, I'd love to introduce our speakers tonight. Uh, on For the proposition side, we have, speaking first, to James Clough, who's Hi. a... Opposition Christian. Oh, your opposition. Yes. yes. Sorry, I put this the wrong around. So, speaking with the proposition, speaking first, we have Eleanor Angwin who is uh, president of the Imperial College Debating Society, is a student of biochem, biochemistry, uh, here at Imperial, um, and has, uh, is in a third year of debating uh, here at Imperial. Uh, speaking with her, we have Alistair Curry, who is a human rights campaigner and also has a lot of experience with animal rights. Uh, he's been a policy advisor at Ethical Treatment of Animals and, uh, yeah, uh, and director at, campaigns director at BUAV, so the British Union of Abolition of Boot Sections. Uh, before going on to all of this, he was a nurse for 17 years. Uh, on the opposition side, we have, uh, speaking first, James Clough, who is a PhD student of uh, physics here at Imperial, uh, and has been debating for longer than I can tell, anyway. <laughs> um, sec uh, speaking second, we've got Tom Holder, who is, uh, who is one of the original members of the protest at Oxford, which uh, stood for animal rights uh, activism back in 2006. Uh, also has organised rallies of researchers in three countries uh, to publicise the, uh, the importance of this. Have I got this the wrong way around? Yeah. You might want to set stand for animal research. Yeah. Setting up for animal research. <laughs> your, your opposition? Yes. Yeah. Opposition to ban. So the motion is to ban. Yeah. I get this. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I get this. So yeah, setting up for animal uh, research uh, and also founded Speaking of Research in 2008 to urge scientists to speak up the need uh, for animal research. Uh, okay, so... Uh, just before we get going, uh, I'd like to, if, if possible, can we have a, a vote on, on who supports this motion before we get going, so we can kind of get an idea if this debate changes anyone's minds. So would you like to raise your hand if you are for banning animal research? Just one? Two? Just, uh, one down there. Three, three, four, four, five, six. Hand right six. up. Hand right up. Yeah. Six. 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 Okay, brilliant. Uh, and then those who are against banning it? So, a lot more confident. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Okay, brilliant. So, we'll see if that changes at the end. Um, so, with no further ado, I call on uh, Eleanor Angwin to raise the case for the proposition. We've got a lot of sheets of paper, sorry. It's how I roll. Ladies and gentlemen, we think for too long scientists have relied on the easy way, which is testing on animals. They haven't decided to look into any further research because they've been able to get away with testing and being cruel and morally abhorrent towards animals. I'm going to bring you a couple of points today, which is firstly, animals have feelings too. And I'm going to use all the claims that they would bring to you as to how we justify animal research and take them down. I'm then going to talk to you about the idea of how these dismissals actually impact on animal research and how that affects the science that goes on behind it and how within adversity science prospers and talk to you about how we can change things in the future. Before I go on to my main points, I'm going to give you an idea of how we would think this would work in the real world. So we understand that currently animal research is something that's incredibly important 
for the future of science, and it's really used in research. So what we would say is over a next five-year period, we would aim to get rid of animal research completely. So this means that we would start by taking out things that aren't exactly necessary right now but are still tested on animals, and eventually lead to having no animal research at all. And what we think is in this five-year period, we give scientists a chance to be able to move towards means of testing that don't require animal suffering. So let's take you on to my first point, which is the idea that animals have feelings too. And I know that sounds a little bit silly, but trust me. Right, so why at the moment is it seen to be okay to test on animals? I'm going to give you a couple of quotations that people often use. So firstly, the idea that animals have little conception of what's going on when they're being tested on, so they don't understand the surroundings around them. So what we say to this is, if you actually look at a lot of animal behaviour research, animals are in fact incredibly intelligent. They're very aware of the surroundings and very aware of things that are going on. So for example, mice, when they're in test, like in test rat, uh, cages, they're often struggling, they're often seen to be upset when they can see mice being disappeared. And see, they are seen to be actively distressed by the fact that people that they share their cages with are disappearing. So they do have a conception of, you know, my friend Jeff, the other mouse, who's like cuter than I am maybe, like them being removed. So they do have this conception of emotions and awareness. The second thing is that the idea of like animals not being able to be clever enough to understand these things. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples of how intelligent animals are, just so that you get the idea that like, animals can be clever, and it's not just like bad things. So firstly, like crows being able to use tools in order to get things out of boxes. They're given a tool and they're able to take it out. That shows that they have an understanding of like things around them, they can conceptualise things. But also the idea of like dolphins being able to be clever and things like that. So all of these things show that animals have some sort of cognitive ability. So where's the issue with animal testing then? Because at the moment they're put under like really bad amounts of stress, really bad amount of torture under the excuse that they just don't, it's fine, they don't understand what's going on. They don't understand that their friends are dying or things like that. And that means that because we don't understand the level of intelligence, there's more suffering that happens to these animals than could be necessary, right? And I'll tell you how that's actually bad later. So then what happens is the next thing that like, they might say is we don't test on really intelligent animals, we like, don't test on monkeys. So the point is, there's no incentive or little incentive for scientists to actually investigate how much cognitive ability animals that they're testing on have. Why is this? This is because science is kind of driven by capitalism. This is because science is driven by these big pharmaceutical companies who have no incentive to invest in working out how a mouse's brain works. They have more of an incentive in working out how like, they're going to come up with a HIV drug or something like that. Like, an example of this is GlaxoSmithKline, where they had a vaccine that actually treated glandular fever and prevented people from getting it, but they didn't invest any money in that. Until the CEO's son this summer got glandular fever, at which point they've started to reinvestigate that thing. We think that's bad, right? Secondly, when they talk about animals not feeling emotions, we say that's wrong, I can give you loads of examples, but it's going to cut too much into my time. So donkeys, penguins, giraffes, elephants, they all show in their behaviour that they feel grief when they have loss. And so given that lots of animals die in the process of animal testing, we can see that animals feel grief and feel emotions. They have some ability to do this. Donkeys feeling depression when they're not actually in like with other donkeys, right? And so it's not just this physical torment that they're put through every day where they have electrodes put on their brain, but also the mental torment too that we can't even ever begin to comprehend. Thirdly, in the fact that they think that they don't feel as much pain as humans or it's okay for animals to feel this pain, right? So we actually don't even understand most of the signalling pathway of pain within humans. So given that, and it's much more of a priority for people to investigate this, it's less likely that people are ever going to even bother doing it. And also, because they benefit from these things, like, it's never going to happen. So how do these dismissals of animals in their, like, in, and their feelings in the first place impact on science and animal research. So we think it leads to this idea that animals are just there to be tested on in terms of just general practice, right? It's not even questioned by most scientists. What happens is they realise, and they'll probably bring it up with this, like, idea that animals are worth less than us, right? Because we can suffer far more of this, right? So what does this mean? It means they're able to justify putting animals through things that potentially they wouldn't have to, right? It means that they, pretend, they just justify it in order to try and get the end goal. And we think that that's not okay. We think at the point where animals are still suffering and animals are continuously suffering, they're born into suffering, they're bred into suffering, we think that it's unfair for us to just sort of not even question that, not even ask about it. 
But moreover, we think what happens is it becomes internalised within the scientist that this animal doesn't really mean anything because it's just the mouse that I practice on. In which case, we can see from things that happened at Imperial itself last year, mean it meant that that's meant to be one of the best scientific institutions in the world, where they have like lab technicians using ID cards in order to try and break open a, a mouse's skull. Right? This is, there's images of this on the internet. It's absolutely disgusting. And the reason why scientists don't even empathise with these animals is because it's so well known and so documented. And it's just part of scientific protocol that they're allowed to do these sorts of things. Right? So what do we think this will lead to if we actually ban animal research? One, animals not suffering. Right? We think that's just the first thing. But more importantly, the idea that science would just stagnate is not true. Because you think that science tends to prosper in adversity. We can see this from the eruption of HIV in 1981, right, when it was first discovered, and how 30 years later we continuously basically have stopped a pandemic mostly from happening, right, by being able to treat with retroviral drugs. We think that science works by there being a problem. And once we have a problem, we can look to solve that problem. We think that as soon as you remove something that is morally abhorrent, that my partner will probably go on to talk about, um, you drive scientists to want to make a difference and try and find new and innovative methods of research, like when they came up with cell cultures to try and tackle, I think it was, uh, polio. Um, so for all of these reasons, for the fact that animals are aware of what's going on around them, for the fact that science is using this as an excuse to be lazy, and the fact that we think it will make science better, Side with proposition. Uh, thank you, Gwenna, for her fine speech. Uh, and we now call James Clough to uh, bring the case to the opposition. Okay, thank you, Christian. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is just clarify, you know, what, what are the two worlds that we're living in on, on our side and on their side? Right? Because what happens in a world where we ban animal testing, a world where you know, five years from now there are no animals in labs and these experiments don't happen, that's a world where cures for diseases that currently make people die are less likely to be found, right? If we did ban animal testing, we have to accept that there are people who would die specifically because we've made that ban, okay? And so it's all well and good for Ellen to say that animals have feelings too, okay? But she's got to compare that, you know, way up the fact that animals get hurt during testing with the fact that if we don't have that testing, actual people are going to die, right? And so all of those things she said about how animals can feel grief and animals can feel pain and animals can feel sadness, we have to weigh that up against the you know, greater capacity of people to feel those emotions as well and acknowledge that you know, if we don't have animal testing, from five, years now, from five years on from now till the, you know, the, to the long future, there will be many generations of people who are left without the kind of cures for diseases that they are also going to suffer from. Okay? And so that's what we need to do in this debate, is try and weigh up those two things. So the first thing I'm going to do is just respond to some of the things that Ellen said that I don't think uh, are quite true. Okay? So what she said was that it's unfair to use animals as a means to human ends, right? I think it's first worth pointing out that we do this all the time in things other than animal research, right? You know, unless you're a vegetarian or a vegan, and most people in the world aren't, you use animals for ends, like literally every meal that you have that includes meat, right? So unless, you know, so, so that principle seems actually quite untenable to hold unless, you know, you also want everyone to become a vegetarian, okay? And it does seem like the benefits we get from eating meat are probably actually smaller than the benefits we get from having cures to diseases. So that's a problem that she has. Um, then there's also, what's also worth pointing out is that uh, although it seems, it might seem cruel to actively hurt an animal, okay, it's equally cruel for us to not help a person, okay, just because you don't see that cruelty, just because that isn't, you, you might not see them dying because they're away in a hospital and not in your lab if you're a scientist, that cruelty is still happening when we decide to not help them. And by banning this testing, we are deciding to not help those people and condemn them to suffering that they wouldn't otherwise have to live through. And that's a real problem when you, when you have this policy of banning animal testing. Um, right, so, so, what Eleanor has, so, so what we need to recognise is when, when Eleanor says that uh, animals have feelings too, we have to weigh up the capacity they have to feel with the capacity humans have to feel. Okay? 
It's worth noting that the kind of animals that are closest to humans, the ones that feel in the most similar way to we do, which are great apes like chimpanzees, gorillas and orangutans, it's already illegal to test on those animals, right? Because, exactly because we do recognize that they are similar to us and they do suffer in a similar capacity to us, okay? And so what, so what we do is we weigh up the cost of hurting those animals with the potential benefits we get. That's why almost all animal testing is done on animals like rats and mice and not on donkeys or penguins or giraffes or monkeys, okay? Not on those kinds of animals that are closer to humans, the animals that are more capable of suffering. So the next thing she says is that it's not necessary, that scientists don't need to use animals. I think it's worth pointing out that m almost all research is not done with animals, okay? Wherever possible, where we can not use animals in our research, we make sure to do that because we want to minimize the suffering that they experience. But unfortunately, sometimes we do need to use animals in testing because that, that's the only way that we can be sure in a lot of instances that our drugs are safe, okay? So almost all testing doesn't use animals, but sometimes it's necessary because biological systems like people and like animals are extremely complicated and it, it's very difficult for us to predict what effects that new drugs are going to have and to know whether new drugs are going to work unless we actually do test them on animals at the end of that testing cycle before we start testing them on the humans, okay? So it's not true to say that the scientists are just cruel and scientists want to hurt the animals. They actually take very great efforts to make sure that the animals are hurt as little as possible, and only when it's absolutely necessary do we actually do that research. In fact, what's also interesting is that it's not only people that benefit from this research, okay? If you have a pet and you take them to the vet, right, when they're sick, how do you think those drugs got made? How do you think those drugs got tested, okay? It's actually true that animals can also benefit from research, right? Because when your pet needs medicine because they're ill, right, that medicine was also developed on animals, okay? So it's not even the case that only humans benefit from this. If you add up the numbers, right, animals can also benefit from testing as well, okay? So that, that's, that's something that's, that's certainly worth pointing out. Then Ellen says that, um, you know, we don't do research into how animals' brains work. That's actually completely untrue. We do lots and lots of research into how animals' brains work, okay? That's how we know that chimpanzees do suffer in a similar way to humans, but, you know, a mouse, for example, doesn't. That's why you know, we recognize that when a mouse gets eaten by a cat in your garden, that isn't, you know, it might be sad, but it's not nearly as sad as when a person gets eaten by a lion, okay, or a person dies of cancer, because we recognize that mice have less of a capacity to suffer than people do. We can measure their brain activity, and we can sort of do science, and scientists do do research into working out how different animals suffer, okay? Of course, we can't be sure that a mouse suffers less than a person, we can't be sure that we can weigh those things up, but we have to make a decision, okay? And to just refuse to make that decision because we're never 100% sure is, is foolish and it's naive because we're going to have to decide and we're never going to be 100% sure whether those animals suffer less than us. But it seems extremely likely because we do this research, because we do look into their brains, okay? And so by doing that, we can genuinely make this kind of, uh, make that kind of weighing up and make that evidence. Maybe there'll be a point in the long and distant future where we, rec where, where we have better tools in animal research, where we don't have to use animals in our research, and when we can use other models and use uh, testing on people or testing on cells. When that point comes, wonderful. We'll stop need to hurt, we'll stop, you know, we won't ever need to hurt animals in our experiments ever again. But we're not gonna reach that point yet. We're, like, we're not there, we still need to use animals. And to, to, to stop testing right now is dangerous because it stops us having that scientific progress that's necessary to be able to prevent people from dying of serious illnesses. So to conclude, you know, let's weigh these things up. It is unfortunate that animals get hurt during testing, right? But there are huge benefits to that testing, benefits now and benefits to generations in the future, right? Diseases that kill people now, that kill millions of people, perhaps we don't see them like we see the pictures in the newspaper of animals being hurt, okay? But that happens and it's gonna happen for years and years and years. If we want to stop those people suffering, we want to stop that much greater harm, a much greater harm because people have a much greater capacity to suffer. The only way for us to do that is to accept that sometimes we do need to test on animals, and that's why we shouldn't have this kind of ban. Okay, thank you very much uh, to James for his speech. Uh, the House now welcomes Alistair Curry uh, to uh, speak again, to speak for this motion. Uh, thank you. Two apologies. I wear very focal, so I can sit down so I can read my notes. Second one is I'm going to run over my time. Tell me when I'm at seven minutes and I'll slow it down. Um, 
I'm not here to win a debate, I'm here to start one. I want to try and make people think differently about the world. And I want to take on first unit James said about the world that we live in and the consequences of abandoning animal experiments. I checked yesterday on the internet, the price of an iPhone 5 is 530 pounds. The price of 1,000 mosquito nets is 540 pounds. And for every 1,000 mosquito nets that are distributed, 5.5 children's deaths are prevented. So the price of an iPhone is five and a half dead children. When we choose to spend our money on an iPhone 5, instead of giving that money to, in fact, there's a, there's a charity called JustNets.net, which distributes those nets. We are making a choice to allow five children to die that we could help. The world we live in is full of people suffering and dying because we don't literally lift a finger to help them. So when we say that we have some sort of moral obligation to inflict suffering and pain on animals, because it will resolve human suffering. We've got a bit of a cheat because we are not helping those people ourselves. The majority of people who die in this world prematurely die of things we can already cure and treat. If we are not helping them, what right do we say we must impose suffering on animals? If you say compassion compels you to do something bad, you better be damn sure you've done everything else you can that compassion compels you to do first. I'm a human rights activist. I was also a nurse for 17 years. I can tell you that this world is not a kind place. It's not a good place. There's a great deal of suffering in this world. So we need to look at what the root causes of those suffering and the values that we, that we have. And I should like to say, I don't consider animal experimenters to be bad people, but we have to recognize that good people do bad things sometimes. And one of the arguments that we just heard, very much the argument we just heard, is about benefit. And let's just look at that straight away. Saying that we get lots of benefit from something, and that justifies it, is, with all due respect, a stupid argument. If I take your wallet, or your watch, or your kidney, I benefit. That doesn't make it right. That argument says that ends justify means, and civilized people don't believe that ends justify means. If we wanted to get the best medical research we could, we would be researching on human beings. AIDS orphans, say, or people suffering from Alzheimer's disease. That would accelerate our pace of, 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 of research hugely. We'd all benefit from that, but we don't do it. We don't do it because it's wrong. Of course it's wrong. If we're going to talk about the rights and wrongs of testing on animals, we need to identify first why it's wrong to test on humans. So if we look at human rights, where do they come from? It used to be if you had the biggest club in the cave, you had the right to do whatever you wanted to other people. Those days are gone now. It doesn't matter what your status is. It doesn't matter what your color is, your theory. You, you should still have rights. But there's also other things which are completely irrelevant to that. Our rights as human beings don't come from how intelligent we are, because we're not all equally intelligent. Someone suffering from a mental handicap or Alzheimer's disease, say, may not know what's going on around them, but it would still be wrong to experiment on those people. We don't deserve our rights because we're good. Well, we're not all good. If I cheat on my wife and lie to my best friend, it still wouldn't be right to cut my brain open and do experiments on it. We're not all good. And the fact we belong to this human society, not everyone does. Would it be right to experiment on a tramp? Or would it be right to experiment, say, on an old lady, all of whose loved ones have died, sitting neglected in the corner of an old people's home? It wouldn't. Where our rights come from is the one thing that we all have in common, that we are vulnerable, that we have these fragile bodies that can easily be hurt, and those, the bodies are hurt by those more powerful than us. And if our rights come from the fact that we're vulnerable, we can't deny it to others who are vulnerable too. No, you don't need to do scientific research. Anyone who has a cat or has seen a dog knows that they, have, that they have feelings, that they can be hurt. No rational person believes that animals don't want to live, that, they, don't, that they, they want to avoid pain, and that they want to be free. And that's why our cat has just, had her, has just been spayed. She is desperate to get out of the house, despite all the food we, the food we give her. It's a basic instinct because freedom is what you need in order to survive. And survival is fundamental to all of us. Three billion years of evolution have made survival fundamental to all of us. I have seen a lot of people die in person. And I've also seen a lot of animals die. And I can tell you absolutely truthfully that humans and animals cling on to life just as dearly. That they want to live every bit as much as we do. And what makes us want to live isn't what's human inside us, it's what animal, what is animal inside us. Because we are animals too. There is no rational reason for denying the, 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 the rights not to, have, not to be killed, not to be experimented on, not to have their freedom um, restricted to animals because they share the most important things that we do, that they can suffer, that they want to live, that they want to be free. 
but we do deny to them. We say they're not deserving of rights. And you look back in history, that's been the engine of so much injustice and pain in the world. This group deserves rights, this group deserves moral respect, and this one doesn't. And the justification for that is always the same, it's always difference. And animals are different to us, of course they're different to us, but the question is, uh, does that difference count? And if they want to live as much as we do, then they are equals in that, and they do want to live as much as we do. And if they are equals in that, they deserve equal rights, and it doesn't matter what, in what other ways they're different or inferior to us. The world gets better when we concentrate on the things that we share. It gets worse when we concentrate on difference. And the world gets better when we deliver our compassion without qualification, without, without discrimination. The only difference that counts between animals and humans is this one. We've got power and they haven't. We can experiment on them and eat them and do all these things until the end of time and they will never be able to fight back. We do it because we can do it. And we give them, we do not experiment on them because they have no value. We give them no value so we can experiment on them. The value of my life and the value of a mouse's life shouldn't be determined by anyone else. The value of our lives is the value we put on them ourselves. And no one who's more powerful than us has the right to say, your life is less important. If that mouse values its life, then its life is every bit as important uh, as ours is, and that makes it wrong to treat it in that way. When the powerful decide the fate of the powerless, which is the kind of world we live in, it's the kind of thing I see every day as a human rights activist, ju and justice is increased and suffering is increased. And so when we talk about doing these, th doing these things, when we talk about terms of a necessary evil, there is no such thing as a necessary evil. Again, I say to those of you who are animal experimenters or support animal experimentation in this room, I don't think you're evil people. I know that you're well motivated. But when we inflict violence, and be absolutely clear that animal experimentation is an act of violence, when we, infl when we inflict violence, sorry, I've just been, been distracted by that. Um, when, when we inflict violence, there can be no justification because of difference. There can be no justification for, for all these other reasons. Sorry, excuse me. We've heard it be cruel not to help a person. We've already heard that we don't help people. We allow people to die all the time. We allow suffering to exist all the time. The only way we fix what's wrong with this world is if we start looking from the bottom up. If instead of relying on assumption that we have the power to decide and those more vulnerable to us are means to our ends, we will never fix our problems in this world. Those who feel and who want to live and want to survive are not means to anyone's end. And the reason that we should end animal experiments is simple. Because if we have to treat something as lowly and pointless and stupid and insignificant as a mouse with respect to value its life, then we can never treat human beings the way we can treat them, as things, as means to an end. We start off with respect for the most lowly. And if we do that, then we have a chance of fixing our world. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Alistair for his uh, speech, and the House now recognises Tom Holden for his uh, to end of day. Mr Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to oppose the motion that we should ban all forms of animal research. Why? I'm going to start the scientific, I'm going to move on to the moral. The fact is, the polio vaccine, blood transfusions, the TB vaccine, asthma treatments, meningitis vaccine, deep brain stimulation, kidney transplants, prenatal care, breast cancer treatments. The other year, the first ever progeria treatment. These are all the benefits which have been accrued thanks to the careful research on animals. I'm not here to convince you that animal research has brought benefit. I find the matter indisputable. And as mentioned before, it is not just humans. All of the veterinary care which we have is made possible through animal research, and not just through research on the same animal. Sometimes you might end up doing research on a ferret for work that will end up benefiting dogs and cats. So what's the cost? Almost four million animals in the UK, which sounds like a lot. It is. Over 97% are mice, rats, birds and fish, animals which are more likely to end up on our dinner plate or in a trap. At Imperial it's over 98% which are mice, rats and fish. And for what? For studies into cancer and heart failure? 
A promising new gene, the uh, gene therapy for heart failure is about to be trialled here, based on research which was done here in mice. So, what if we were all part of a giant experiment here? This room, this institution, would need a licence to carry out animal research from the Home Office. Every one of you who is doing the animal research would need a licence from the Home Office. This project that we were going to do, this piece of research, would need a licence. An ethical review panel would do a harm-benefit analysis to decide whether the benefits of this research outweighed the cost, in terms of suffering, to the animals. There would be inspections, both announced and unannounced, by the Home Office. We would have to obey the three R's. Refinement. This might be better training for technicians or use of anaesthesia. It does include housing animals together, because animals do get stressed when isolated. So general practice is wherever possible you house animals together. To reduce the number of animals, to use the other methods we have to use scans. Um, a lot of the time it is scanning methods which help us reduce the numbers we use. Or simply to use less and still hope we can get the same statistical significance. And replacement. It is illegal to use an animal in research if there is an alternative. Let me say that once more. In fact... Let me read out the law on it. The use of animals for scientific or educational purposes should only be considered where a non-animal alternative is unavailable. There is some idea, some conspiracy that we have all these better techniques and for some reason scientists choose not to use them, these cheaper, more reliable techniques. If we had them, we're both morally and legally bound to use them. I don't know why we use animals in every experiment that exists, but I have spoken to, uh, to scientists up and down the country, and whenever I do speak to them, they're always very, very clear on exactly why the research could only be done on animals and not by another method. Animals aren't perfect, they're just a model. Humans are just a model, and indeed, we do use humans. They are a core part of testing. The largest part of the American budget for Research goes on to clinical testing in humans. But it remains necessary, and anyone who doubts it should just look at something like Herceptin, which is a breast cancer drug, and is a humanised mouse protein. No mouse, no drug could have been developed. We can't always see the benefits, but almost every Nobel Prize is either directly involved or through work is built on work which involved animals. To take an example, John Gurdon, who won it in 2012, he did work in the 60s on cloning a frog. He didn't know where this was going. He knew it could be important, and it wasn't until 40 years later, a person called Yamanaku shared the Nobel Prize, who worked out how we could create IPS cells, which is the basis, hopefully, for the uh, all modern stem cell therapy. It could save millions of lives. Now, on the morality, I differ here because I say it would be immoral not to do the research to alleviate human and animal suffering. By the time I finish my talk, 14 people will have died of malaria. That's millions every year. And yes, we do need to put more money into mosquito nets, and there is a lot of selfishness in this world which prevents us saving lives that we can. But ultimately, this is just another way of saving lives. We are cutting down um, HIV in Africa, partly through work like sharing or giving out condoms has a huge impact, but also because of antiretrovirals which help turn AIDS from being a death sentence to something people can live their whole life with. How is it that we can stand in an ivory tower with an 80-year life expectancy and say, that's it, there's no more cures for anyone else. We can't create new treatments for the rest. We're happy with where we are. We do use animals. We do believe it is right to use animals. But if we believed all of this was wrong, we would have an awful lot of jobs to do. For a start, cats kill around 225 million animals every year in the UK. 
225 million. We use 4 million in research. So should we be declaring a war on nature to prevent animals killing other animals? No, because we do see a difference between human rights, which come from a way of mediating human-to-human -human interaction because of our greater sentience. We can't take back animal suffering that has happened in the past, and there has been. Animal welfare is constantly improving. We are constantly finding more ways to improve how we do it to reduce animal suffering. But to stop it now would be to transfer that suffering to the next generation. I say, once again, it would be morally wrong not to do what we can to alleviate human suffering. And I honestly urge you that we must oppose this motion because a ban would have that impact. Thanks very much. Um, so, before we move on, can we have one final round of applause for all of the speakers? So, we're now going to move on to a, a question and answer session. Uh, so, if anyone's got any questions for any of the speakers on the board uh, about their views or opinions, uh, you know, please go ahead. If there's anyone. Yeah. I've got a question for the opposition. I mean, what I don't think I've heard you respond to is the argument that came up by the very beginning from the proposition about the fact that there are scientific advances into alternative possibilities that are being stunted by the fact that animal experimentation exists. We don't, you say that there are, the alternatives aren't as good as animal experimentation, but we're not looking into alternatives as much as we could be because we use animal experimentation as the way that it normally happens. Um, thanks for the question. Um, the reality is, is that, by and large, these alternative methods are much cheaper. You know, to work with a computer, to work with cell lines, is a lot cheaper than the huge expenses which come from the high standards of animal welfare involved in animal research. So already there is a massive impetus or push from the research community to try and abolish as much animal research as possible. And although we see the number of animals... Uh, that are used in research going up, we actually see that that funding going up, going into biomedical research is going up even more. So in a sense, animal research is becoming a smaller, smaller part of that pie because we are finding and developing alternatives. But what we don't have is, you know, we can't be sure that there will ever be this point where when you've tested it in, when you've looked at things in test tubes and you've looked at things on computers which generally use animal data, that you need a whole organism before you move it into a human. And the last point is I would say a lot of these alternatives actually complement. They're used alongside. You talk to an animal researcher and they'll say they spend as much time looking at the cell cultures that they've taken from the animals or using the animal data to create computer models that they're more of a complement rather than necessarily substitutes. Yeah, I'd agree with everything, everything we've just heard. It, it's uh, actually far, far cheaper to not use animals in your research, right? Research done... Uh, with a computer can be done a lot faster and a lot more cheaply than animal research because there is the, there's a huge set of laws that protect animals during this research that, mean, that means that their research is extremely expensive that's why almost all of this biomedical research is not done using animals and that only when it's absolutely a last resort so in fact the companies that Eleanor spoke about have very strong incentives to try and develop non-animal research and in fact they spend lots and lots of money on developing other ways of doing their research because that's better for them and it's a lot cheaper. Like if, if they were able to do their research without animals, then they would gladly do it. And they do for many diseases, uh, but unfortunately sometimes it is necessary. Um, it, it is usually cheaper, not always, but usually cheaper to use an alternative than, than an animal. What is not cheaper is to develop a new technique rather than to keep using a technique that already exists. So exactly as you were saying, what, what happens is that if you spend, you could spend $10 million trying to develop a new technique, if it doesn't work at the end, you've thrown that $10 million away. Now, there are very strong arguments, actually, I haven't really gone into here about why that technique using animals doesn't work very well. But it's the technique that's accepted and recognized at the moment, so you can do that, in, you can do that instead, and that's the sort of, if you like, it's the path of least resistance using animals. Yes, where an alternative exists, there is a legal obligation to use it. The problem is that that funnel, that supply of, of alternatives, is exactly as you say, stymied by concentration on a different kind of research. Okay, wonderful. Uh, any other questions? Well, 
naturally have. Uh, so, uh, do humans have naturally have authority over animals? Is that the question? Um, so, I don't think that humans do necessarily naturally have an authority over animals in that we should be able to do anything we want to them. Uh, and that's why we don't do anything we want to them. I think what humans do have a responsibility to do is to try and minimise the amount of suffering in the world, right? Because I agree it would be really nice if we were able to care for all living things, but sometimes we're in a situation where we have to make a choice between caring for one thing and caring for another. And animal testing is one of those difficult choices where we have to decide, do we want to care for people, uh, for, for people who we can save from illnesses, or do we want to stop testing on animals? I mean, if you, if you think about it, if animal testing hadn't, you know, if a lot of animal testing hadn't happened in the past, then there are people in this room right, who would be dead. There, you know, some of you wouldn't be alive. You would have been killed by smallpox, or you would, would have been disabled permanently and be in a wheelchair because of polio, okay? And so we can't always make the decision of uh, helping everyone. We have to decide whether we want some of you to be killed by smallpox or we want to do testing on mice. What? Uh, I was going to say, what James says there is, in the past, people have done experiments which were probably bad and they've led to good things coming out of them. But at the same time, like he's not taking into account that if we stop doing bad things, then there are still other ways that things can happen. So, for example, when he talks about smallpox, they used to vaccinate, like they used to vaccinate each other. It, like that's not a really good method of coming up with like a solution. So the point is, by banning animal research, you can try and move towards a means where no one has to suffer. Because at the moment, when they do trials, they're not actually allowed to, in most cases, let the animal die. But what they do is they measure how quickly the mouse loses weight as it gets progressively more and more ill. So they basically make it have all the hor like horrible symptoms of the diseases that exist to test them. When they could do other things just to a point where the animal is about to die, and then I think they have to put them out of their misery or they then start treating them. It's just incredible suffering, and it's something we can prevent. The only guaranteed outcome of an animal experiment is dead animals. That's the only thing that's going to happen, that you know is going to happen at the end of an animal experiment. That animal experiment may lead to a cure for, 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 for Parkinson's disease, or something like that. It may not. Spending £540 on a thousand mosquito nets will save the lives of five point five. Five and a half children. We have a, what the choice we have is a choice between doing something that we know will save people's lives, and the only sacrifice that's made is we don't get to play with our new digital toy, which is slightly better than our old digital toy. And I have a digital toy. I'm not criticising people for, for, for buying iPhones. That's the, that's the choice. And letting people die. Or this, inflicting suffering, brain damage, even for the, um, doing stuff which would lead to animals suffering from epilepsy, which I have, by the way. Um, and uh, genetically engineering mice so that they have cancer. People have been doing that for years and years. Yes, we have made some progress in treating cancer. It still hasn't delivered. We haven't cured Alzheimer's disease yet, despite countless uh, amounts of money uh, spent on it. Of course we need medical research. When I talk about Alzheimer's, I think as patients of mine, and the way they've suffered and the way their family suffered, I'm not in any way saying we don't need medical research and we don't need cures. But the choice is a false choice between medical research using animals and saving people lives, because we do not need a single penny spent on any medical research, and certainly on animal research, in order to save people's lives. We have no right to inflict suffering on others, and we won't take steps ourselves that can save lives. I'm not sure the, uh, the point with regards to uh, mosquito nets is actually relevant, and the reason I'll explain is that they're proposing that instead of uh, the use of animals that we can develop using you know, a lot of money alternative methods, which we're doing all the time anyway, um, but there's this idea that that money is fine. We, you know, that's also money that could have gone on these mosquito nets. So either if if you want your um, point to be relevant, then you've got to say, well, we'll just stop doing medical research. We'll put it all into uh, the development of things to help the third world that are cheap and a surefire thing. So that's, a, that's a perfectly legitimate argument, which people in this room should be should be considering. I think you know it's a it's a good question, Tom, but it is a perfectly legitimate. But the way that, uh, sadly, well, sadly or not, the way work, uh, capitalism works is that there needs to be an impetus for things to happen. There needs to be people to fund it. And what is available is funding for medical research. And so it comes down to a choice between whether we drive it all into alternatives or we continue with animal research. And what I put to you is that 
the alternatives which are used alongside animal research can never fully replace it, can never fully replace it. It's not that case of we haven't found it. The nature of them is we can never deliver the complexities, or at least at no time in the foreseeable future, certainly not the next five years, the complexities of an entire organism. So could I, I just say, and I know that we can't uh, fully open up questions, but I'm very aware of the fact that no one's actually answered your question about whether or not we have authority over animals, that we went straight back into the usual arguments <laughs> about alternatives and all those, all those kinds of things. I don't think we have authority over animals, what we have is power over, over animals. And those who have power, you know, I imagine we've all seen Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. We have power over other people, and the choices are made over other people, but we do have power over animals. And I think the best principle for rights is those who are the weakest, who are the most vulnerable, are the ones who need the greatest level of protection. There is almost nothing more vulnerable or weak than a mouse in a, in a laboratory. Okay, great. Uh, any more questions? Uh, John? Um, so I, I can see the point that uh, monkeys have the same feelings and it's not about the intelligence of a being or the capacity to realize what's going around, to have a feeling to be able to be get exploited, or that that is a valid point for, for animal testing. But where would you set the boundaries then? Because, I mean, a certain perception can be given to almost any living matter, to a tree, to a worm, to anything, and a, 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 a method of um, acting upon negative stimuli. So only because we can send stimuli doesn't mean that then, then you know, where do you would set yeah. down the boundary? I, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a reasonable question. I mean, it has analogies, which obviously we don't get, want to get into to abortion, but there is a, there is a line of sentience and it reduces it, uh, and it reduces down to a point. I don't actually, for instance, I don't eat honey, I'm a vegan, but I'm not really sure whether bees suffer or not. I, I, I don't know. I'm just thinking, you know, I can live without honey. So why not, why not give, them, give them the benefit of the doubt? But, so I think a reasonable perception is that something with a central nervous system uh, with, so, with, with some form of brain, we should probably give it the benefit of the doubt. We know once we get into vertebrates, but essentially it's the same mechanisms as we have that they have. And let's remind ourselves, there's no question about whether animals suffer. We have laws in this country in order to prevent animals suffering, because we know that we know they do. The interesting point about animal experimentation is that allows you to do things to animals which you would not be allowed to do in any, in any other circumstance. And just finally, Yes, plants, for instance, do have mechanisms by, re by which they defend themselves, but they don't have any capacity that anyone would recognize to want anything. It's like a car alarm going off. It's protecting itself, but it's a mechanism. It's not, a, it's not a motivated by consciousness or desire. And animals are conscious. We all know it. Every single one of us knows it. It's not a thing that we have to prove. But we are just another animal on that chain. And our consciousness is higher than theirs, but it's absolutely clear. Anyone who spent any time with animals knows that, knows that they are. So yeah, that border is difficult to judge. But we know it's real. We know that the animals that we're talking about here, which are vertebrate animals, do suffer, are conscious, do want to live, do want to be free. Um, so yeah, I, I, I would agree that animals are conscious. I'm not going to disagree with that at all, just so we can be clear. But um, you know, this, this argument that we're hearing at the moment actually isn't relevant to animal research. This argument says we need to be removing our other use of animals far, far, far before we start looking at whether animal research is justified. We eat 900 million chickens in this country every year. Four million animals are used for research every year, which over your lifetime works out as about four mice and a little under one rat and one fish for all the benefits you get for medicine versus making your chicken dinner just that little bit tastier. So I'm not, uh, unless you are proposing and believing that we should be removing all animal use, then uh, I don't see this as an argument against or for banning animal research. As Tom knows, I actually do propose all those things. I'm a vegan, I think that everyone in this room should, uh, should be as well. But the fact that doesn't, that's not a justification saying there is one bad thing over here, so let's not solve the other bad thing. And I think when we're looking at numbers, it's very important. Yeah, two million chickens a day get their throats cut in, in, this, in this country. It, it's appalling. But, we do, but when you start talking about those numbers, you don't think about what it, is, what it means. It's just that every single chicken, its desire to live, its fear, its suffering, that multiplied two million times a day. Now, you're right, it's far fewer, uh, far fewer animals that use, but every single one of those four million animals doesn't want to be killed. It wants to live, it wants to be free, it wants to pursue it, its own life, it wants not to suffer. So every single one of those lives is precious. It's not precious to me, 
It's not precious to anyone here, but it's precious to that animal. And we must respect that. We should respect that because if we don't respect the perceptions of others, then I'm aware there's young people in this room. I'm going to say, it, then we're fine. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think it's I think it's a great question, right? Because clearly, uh, you know, to the extent that animals experience suffering, there is there is some sliding scale, right? From from humans down to great apes to monkeys to to mice, and then all the way down to fish, which you know, as Tom pointed out, a lot of research, uh, and then down down to insects or plants, right? Uh, and he points out very correctly that you have to you have to just make a judgment call, right? Knowing that mice do suffer a lot less than people do, they still do suffer, but they suffer less than people do. Do you think that the suffering of a person undergoing a horrible disease is worth the lives of four mice, right? Four mice that, that my cat might kill in a week. I think that's a trade-off that, that we should be willing to make. I think that's actually an excellent deal to save someone's life in exchange for, for having four mice uh, undergo animal testing. If the number was many more, if it was, you know, I, I think it would probably be a good deal if it was thousands of mice being killed in animal testing to save one of your lives. I think four mice is an, it's a bargain, and, and we should be thankful that science is so so far advanced at this point that we have to use so few animals to develop cures uh, to, to save our lives. You know, in in a, f in a few decades, hopefully, we won't need those mosquito nets at all because we will have cured malaria thanks to this kind of animal testing. So yeah, you're absolutely right. That kind of research is cruel and unnecessary, and that's why it's entirely illegal uh, in this country, in the European Union, to, to test cosmetics on animals. Uh, I think that's, that's, it's excellent that that's illegal, because the benefits we get from that kind of testing are outweighed by the suffering of those animals. So you're absolutely right, I agree with you. And that's why, uh, that's why it's illegal and should remain illegal. Uh, but testing that saves people's lives is completely different to that, and we need to keep it. This, constant, this reflects the constant improvement in animal welfare. Every time animal welfare improves, we decide that certain things should not be done because they're not justified by any animal suffering, uh, which is why we remove certain animals from being uh, used in research and why more animals are covered by the Animal Welfare Act. So just to say once again, we don't do cosmetic, country in this co in cosmetic testing in this country across the... European Union, I think that's a good thing because it is not justified, whereas medical research is justified. Yeah, well, just to clarify, yes, I, 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 I worked towards the ending of that uh, cosmetics testing on animals, and I have to say that, that many, many of the people on the other side supported that, and that was, that was very welcome. It does still take place across the world, it takes pl take place in, uh, in many places, and although the EU rules say that we shouldn't be able to buy things which are tested on animals here, it does still happen. Various complexities, but yeah, I think we don't need to focus on that. But we need to worry about this notion of between justified and unjustified. When is killing justified? The people who flew planes into the Twin Towers honestly, genuinely, in their hearts of hearts, believed that what they were doing was justified, that a greater good would come from it. I'm not saying that animal experimenters are like Muslim terrorists, but I am saying that that principle, that that some violence towards others. It is justified that some killing is justified is a really dangerous world to go down if we want to live in a fair and just world we don't ever accept that. Um, any more questions? Go on. If animals hurt one another more than humans do, what's the difference between humans as an animal? Choice. We don't have to. Oh, my cat, I've talked about my cat, who's sucking indoors, and probably the reason that she wants so desperately to get out of the so she can go out there and kill some animals, even though we feed her every day, every, every day, because she doesn't have a choice, even though she gets fed every day, all her instincts and all her compulsions say to her, go out and kill stuff. That, 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 that's what they do. We have choice. In the past, and still, human beings kill one another. I deal with that not on a daily basis, but probably on a, on a weekly or monthly basis in my particular job in human rights, I see people killing other people. That is wrong because they have a choice. And you cannot say 
that, that um, look, because animals kill one, kill one another, that somehow makes it all right for us to treat them. We are, I genuinely believe, I absolutely believe we are better than animals. But if we're going to be better than animals, we have to show ourselves to be better than animals, and we have to not behave like animals. So we, we have, uh, from the opposition, that clear difference about choice. And actually, for me, it's that choice that says we have a responsibility to do this research. We have a responsibility to do all we can to alleviate the terrible suffering that exists in humans and indeed in animals, to work hard so that we know how to improve animal welfare and so that we can meet their needs, but also for humans. I do believe humans are more important, that we need to do what we can, that we have a responsibility to do what we can to try and alleviate the suffering of each other, those around us, and those in far-flung places. Yeah, I, th I, think it's, I think it's a great question. And you, know, you can illustrate the kind of trade-off that we have to make by just noticing that you could save far more mice just by having an indoors cat right, than you could save by stopping animal research. The benefit of, you know, what the benefit a cat has from going outside is, is you know, it exists, but it's probably small. The benefit we have from having animal research is that more of you are alive in this room right now. Okay? So yeah, I, I think that, that excellently illustrates that the cost of animal research is, is so small that in other fields of our life it seems it seems trivial, right? Those poor mice's lives. But but when it's to do with animal research, it gets blown out of proportion. The benefits of it just vastly outweigh that. Part. Can I just say very quickly, just so we don't spend too much time talking about this? I believe there are far too many cats in this country. <laughs> 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 Yeah, I, I love my I love my cats. We've got we've got two of them, but our, we have cats because some irresponsibly bred bred kittens who didn't have a home that they they could go to. We absolutely should have fewer cats in this country. We absolutely should have fewer dogs. I love them to death, but you know what? The fact that I love my cats, or or, or my dogs, or indeed our rats that, that that we have, doesn't justify us using them for our for our amusement and our ends. I'm fortunate in that all our rescued animals uh, are out there in the world, and I don't believe we should kill them. So I get to look after them. And, and, enjoy, and enjoy their company. But we should have far, far fewer cats. I mean, far fewer mice and far fewer dogs. Okay, uh, wonderful. So we're going to cut it short there before we, you know, I'll give a fail, you know, shall we have cats? Um, <laughs> so, out of interest then, uh, we can hold another vote on, uh, on your opinions, see if this has changed anyone's mind. Uh, so, who oh, is this? Are we going to do summations? Or Sorry? Are we going to do summations? Um, I thought that was the plan. Yeah, we could just do very quick. Okay, do, do you want to then? We'll go, we'll go straight into uh, sort of, what, two minutes of nations? Yeah. yeah. Okay, brilliant. What we have still heard, 90% of the argument that you've heard from this side is benefit. What Tom did in six minutes of his seven minutes was talk to you about benefit. Benefit, 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 benefit. I, as I said, I'm not denying the existence of benefit. But it's rather like if I spent six minutes talking to you about all the cool things I bought with the money that I stole from you. It doesn't make it right. You have to look under that and say, can you, can you justify it? And that's what something that the other side would completely avoid of doing. And I have another question. Did anyone in this room, and I, 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 I really like Tom, I have a lot of respect for him, but when he described, he said something about human morality being it's something that mediates human interactions or, or something like that. I did not. Standard, his justification for a difference between the way we treat animals and the way we treat humans. What he's repeatedly said to you today is, I believe it's right to do animal research. I believe that humans are more important than animals. I believe, I believe. That's not an argument, that's an opinion. And what he hasn't done is actually address any of the issues that I raised about the common, commonality of suffering between animals and humans. And I'll tell you why he hasn't done that. Seriously, because it isn't an answer. I've been, I've been working in animal rights as a professional or an amateur for more than 20 years, I have never, ever, literally never, ever heard a coherent response to that, that argument, ever. There isn't one, and that's why it doesn't get made. But have a go just now. <laughs> Don't tell us about benefits. Don't tell us what you believe. Tell us why it's, it's wrong to do experiments on an old lady suffering from Alzheimer's disease, but it's right to do them on a monkey. T answer that question. Do it now. I wish I had uh, enough time to fully go into the issue of rights, uh, but to clarify, uh, human rights didn't exist from you know day one. What happened is that people found they could create a contract with each other. I don't hurt you, you don't hurt me. It was a two-way understanding. With my rights come my responsibility. 
If I don't do something, I have a job not to, I have a job not to do it to you if I expect the same. The reason is as humans have that rationality, that choice about them, which is what created uh, our yeah, rights. Right. And so uh, this is the reason, this is the basis for which I uh, place the importance of humans above animals. And yes, we do extend it to some of those who do not have rights. Perhaps in a Rawlsian world where we're not sure whether we start as the disabled person or as someone in this room, and that is the basis. But the fact is, is that we have that choice, and with that we have to uh, decide, do we believe that a few mice or a few humans are worth more? Not one of you, I dare not one of you, sees a, a, a child and a... Uh, small mouse, a baby mouse in the road and decide not to save the human because we know, because for all this sophistry about right, we know what is the right thing to do, we know about what we should do with humans any person here who challenges that I would be surprised because we would find them immoral in this world we must do animal research if we are to alleviate human and animal suffering because we have that choice we're the only species that has the ability to make that choice and has the technological capability to have that choice. Okay, okay wonderful. So if we'd like to, uh, should we move on to a vote? Everyone who's in favour of banning animal research, if you'd like to raise your hand. That's one, two, three, four, five, okay. six, seven. In favour of banning? Uh, seven. Okay. What, is that eight? Okay. You have that's that's seven, that's seven, that's an eight. 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 Um, who is who is against banning animal research? So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Okay, eleven. So it looks like we've had two people switch sides. So although the although the room is in generally still um, for keeping animal research, we seem to have uh, the the proposition seems to have done a good job in getting some people over. Um, so you know. Uh, we're about to finish now, here. Yeah? Uh, I hope that the debate doesn't finish. I hope that you know you take this back uh, and the debate continues, uh, and you know maybe one day we'll come to a, a final conclusion on this. But in the meantime, can we have one more round of applause for our speakers? Um, and I thank you very much for coming. Uh, good night. And thank you, Christian, as well. Yay! <laughs>